that vaguely obituarial uh, introduction that I see on the posters around the church. Um, it's always nice to hit what they call the highlights. In the, but I, I always think I should sort of append to that introduction um, a, a little notice. I, I was raised by Irish Catholics. That always sounds like wolves to me for some reason. <laughs> um, but it was a culture in which the men were supposed to grow up and become either priests or alcoholics. And so I always feel like I should begin by saying my name is Tom and I am not a priest. <laughs> so, uh, but I was named for one happily. Um, well, not a, well, it was a long time ago. Uh, my father's uncle was, uh, he survived the Spanish flu and I think that sort of led his mother to remind him that he was probably saved for a purpose. You had this happen in John Wesley's life, right? And that uh, fire in the, in the manse in Epworth sometime in the 18th century, early on, I think it was. And uh, everybody got out except little Jackie boy. I think it was set by the parishioners, if I'm not mistaken. At least there were rumors to that effect, something to do with his father's preaching. So. Um, be forewarned, all of us. But um, anyway, Jackie appeared at the upper window waving, saying, hello. <laughs> and um, two of the locals uh, conspired to one stand on the other's shoulders, a kind of a human ladder, and got the little boy, then five or six years old, out of the house at which his mother, was she Susanna, said something to the effect of a brand plucked from the fire. Uh, paraphrasing Zechariah at the um, the cleansing of uh, Joshua, the high priest, a, black, a brand plucked from the fire. I always love that term, the notion that the miraculous is oftentimes a conspiracy of the near to hand. You know, and we know what happened to little Jackie. He grew up and went to school at Oxford and, and became very holy and and developed with his brother a method for being holy. Hence, uh, the naysayers, the begrudgers always around would call him them Methodists. And I suppose a little bit like Obamacare, he said that suits. And they were Methodists ever after, right? So um, I, uh, I've always been impressed by that. And I, uh, um, I remember being asked by a, a musician friend of mine, a composer at the University of Michigan, uh, who had been inspired by a trip through the cemetery, if I could write a poem about uh, about uh, some of the headstones he'd seen in there. He had asked several poets to do this very thing, and I said, yes, I'm happy to do that. I'm sure there's a stipend you have in mind. And he said, oh yeah, there'll be, there'll be something. And we left it at that. He's a great composer. Evan Chambers is his name. And uh, he gave me the, the uh, wording on the headstone, which went like this. It was on grave number 78 of the old burying ground in Jaffrey Center, New Hampshire. You can go and see this if you want. It's there. I think you could probably Google it and get pictures of it. But it says, here is interred the remains of Isaac A. Spofford, the son of Deacon Eliezer and Mrs. Mary Spofford, a brand plucked from the ashes of Reverend Laban Ainsworth's house. This happened on the 13th of February, 1788. Um, and then it said, O oh, say grim death, why thus destroy the parents' hope, their fondest joy? Cease man to ask the hidden cause. God's will is done. Revere his laws. <coughs> now that little um, verse, that little rhyme and meter, was written by Reverend Laban Ainsworth, who it turns out, it was his house um, that burned down. They were celebrating his betrothal that night. His co-religionists had brought in cheeses and cakes and ices and, and casseroles, no doubt. And, and they were all celebrating when a fire uh, caught up. They all ran out into the snow and um, thought everything was fine until afterwards they found the body of the boy who'd been sleeping upstairs, the deacon's boy who died smoke inhalation and um, 
And Reverend Lavin Ainsworth, who it turns out had the longest continuous ministry in American history, serving this one church in Jaffrey Center, New Hampshire for I think 78 years. He lived to be 101. Uh, they rebuilt the house, they buried the boy. Uh, but if you go through that cemetery, every one of the gravestones bears um, an inscription made by Reverend Lavin Ainsworth because he became the obituarist, the eulogist, the pastor, and the stone carver uh, for the locals in their deaths. It's quite a remarkable multitasking for any minister, and I, I think you're probably used to that around here. The Wesley boys were pretty good at that. They did the songs, the stories, the theology. Um, every funeral director knows certainly that Food is best at the Methodist Church. If you know, when we bury the saints from the Methodist, we all stay for lunch afterwards because they take potluck and a bake sale seriously. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Here's the poem I wrote for that little thing, which was actually performed at um, Carnegie Hall. And he said, "Would you like to come and perform that with the orchestra that's going to do it. I said, where is it? Carnegie Hall. I said, yes, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and it will go in my obituary. <laughs> but I, I read this to give you, uh, as an intro to the notion, um, well, I'll read it. No doubt the Reverend Ainsworth read from Job over the charred corpse of the deacon's boy to wit, blessed be the name of the Lord, or some such comfortless dose of holy writ that winter morning after the house fire. But all of the first congregationalists of Jaffrey Center, New Hampshire, out weeping and gnashing, out in the snow while the manse at Main Street and Gilmore Pond Road blazed into the early Thursday morning. God's will is done, as often without warning as with one. Either way, Revere his laws is cut into the stone to rhyme with a previous sentiment. Cease man to ask the hidden cause. As if the answers ever were forthcoming. So little is known of young Isaac A. Spofford, his father Eleazar, his mother Mary, his death on the 13th of February in 1788. A brand plucked from the ashes reads the stone of Reverend Lavin Ainsworth's house, which frames the sadness in the pastor's burning faith in God's vast purposes. As if the boy long buried here was killed to show how God makes all things work together towards some good. And yet the stone's inquiry still haunts. Oh, say, grim death, why thus destroy the parents' hope, their fondest joys? Or say instead, grim death destroys us all by mighty nature's witless random laws whereby old churchmen, children, everything, all true believers, all who disbelieve come to their ashen ends and life goes on. Those of you who have suffered a death in the family know that that last line, that life goes on, often said as a source of comfort is also very often a source of hurt. How can life go on so utterly changed as it is by the death of the people we love, the death of people who held up our part of life? And most of my years as a funeral director, I have found, uh, has, have involved a, an effort to avoid the temptation to constantly shake a fist in God's face and say, what did you have in mind here, God? I felt that way the day I got the note from Jason telling me about his diagnosis. As if he were saying, I kept a book too long from the library. I have cancer. Just another thing that happens in the way things happen. And I can imagine for you that the idea of walking the walk and talking the talk of the mortal, the dying and the dead, these are not theories for you now. This becomes part of the stations of the cross that will become part of your congregational life in the weeks and months and years, please God, 
the Jawahu. This whole problem of how can a good God who's in charge here let such things happen? It bedevils us as it's bedeviled people of our kind forever and ever and ever. I'm going to read you a couple paragraphs from an essay I wrote some years ago. And it, it kind of comes from reading that purification of the temple scripture that I think is, comes out of the lectionary this time of Lent. When Jesus got mad at the money changer, changers and the people selling doves and oxen and what have you. I've always liked that he got angry because I've been angry a long time. And uh, getting past that anger uh, has been a, a challenge. And when I do, I feel uh, as if I could believe in a loving God. And when I don't, I feel, well, Jesus knows how I feel. The poor cousin of fear is anger. It is the rage that rises in us when our children do not look both ways before running into busy streets or take to heart the free advice we're always serving up to keep them from pitfalls and problems. It's the spanking or tongue lashing, the door slam, the kick dog, the clenched fist, the love, God help us, the hurt, the greed. It is the war we wage against those facts of life over which we have no power. Here is a thing that happened. I just buried a young girl whose name was Stephanie. She was named for St. Stephen, the first martyr, the patron of stone masons. She died when she was struck by a cemetery marker as she slept in the back seat of her parents' van as the family was driving down the interstate on their way to Georgia. It was the middle of the night. The family had left Michigan that evening to drive to a farm in Georgia where the Blessed Mother was set to appear and speak to the faithful on the 13th of every month. As they motored down the highway in the dark through mid-Kentucky, some local boys, half an hour south, were tipping headstones in the local cemetery for something to do. They picked one up that weighed about 14 pounds, a stone. What they wanted with it is anyone's guess, and as they walked across the overpass of the interstate, they grew tired of carrying their trophy. With not so much malice as mischief, they tossed it over the rail as the lights of the southbound traffic blurred below them. It was at this moment that the van that Stephanie's father was driving intersected with the stolen marker from the local cemetery. The stone was falling earthward at 32 feet per second per second. The van was heading south at 70 miles per hour. The stone shattered the windshield, glanced off of Stephanie's father's right shoulder, woke her mother riding in the passenger seat, and parting the space between the two front seats struck Stephanie in the chest as she lay sleeping in the back seat. She had just traded places with her younger brother, who cuddled with his two other sisters in the rear seat of the van. It did not kill Stephanie instantly. Her sternum was broken, her heart bruised beyond repair. A trucker stopped to radio for help, but at 2 a.m. in nowhere, Kentucky, on a Friday morning, such things take time. The family waited by the roadside, reciting the rosary as Stephanie gasped for air and moaned. They declared her dead at the hospital two hours later. Stephanie's mother found the stone in the back seat and gave it to the authorities. It read, reserved, foster, and was reckoned to be the corner marker from the foster lot in Resurrection Cemetery. Sometimes it seems like multiple choices. A, it was the hand of God. God woke up one Friday the 13th and said, I want Stephanie. How else to explain the fatal intersection of bizarre events? Say the facts slowly. They sound like God's handiwork. If the outcome were different, we'd call it a miracle. Or B, it wasn't the hand of God. God knew it, got word of it sooner or later, but didn't lift a hand because he he knows how much we've come to count on the laws of nature, gravity, and 
objects in motion and at rest. So he doesn't fiddle with the random or deliberate outcomes. He regrets to inform us of this, but surely we must understand his position. Or C, the devil did it. If faith supports the existence of goodness, then it supports the probability of evil. And sometimes evil gets the jump on us. Or D, none of the above. Shit happens. That's life. Get over it. Get out of it. Or maybe E, all of the above. Mysteries, like decades of the rosary, glorious and sorrowful mysteries. Each of the answers leaves my inheritance intact. My father's fear, my mother's faith. If God's will, then shame on God is what I say. If not, then shame on God. It sounds the same. I keep shaking a fist in the almighty face, asking, where were you on the morning of the 13th? The alibi changes every day. Of course, the answers, the ones that faith does not require and are not forthcoming, would belong to Stephanie's parents and to the hundreds like them I've known over the years. I promised Stephanie's headstone for Christmas, actually for St. Stephen's Day, December 26, the day we all remember singing Good King Wenceslaus. Stephen was accused of blasphemy and stoned to death in 35 AD. When I first took Stephanie's parents to the cemetery to buy a grave for their daughter, her mother stood in the road and pointed to a statue of the risen Christ. I want her over there, she said, at the right hand of Jesus. We walked across the section to an empty, unmarked space underneath the outstretched granite right arm of Christ. Here, Stephanie's mother said, her wet eyes cast upward into the gray eyes of Christ. Stephanie's father, his eyes growing narrow, was reading the name on the neighboring grave. Foster is what it read. It was cut in stone. I think the fist that I shake in the face of God keeps asking for the miracle with the name on it that I want the outcome for. Your pastor, you pray, must have a miracle. Uh, this time, a couple years ago, I was teaching in Atlanta at the Candler School of Theology. I have about as much business teaching theology to young seminarians as I do posing for a bronze of Brad Pitt. But um, <laughs> there I was. And uh, a dear friend of mine, Seamus Heaney, the Nobel Laureate, perhaps one of the few poets in the whole world that are not internationally unheard of, um, came to give a reading. And what would turn out to be one of his last readings. On the day he was, he read a poem called Miracle, and I want to end with this, because it suggests a different theology than the one I've always had in mind. He, um, he talked about the miracle when Jesus is in Capernaum. I think this happens in three of the four Gospels. And they bring the paralytic to him. You know this story. The house is crowded, people are spilling out of the door onto the street. The team of bearers that bring the paralytic to, to see Jesus for his healing can't get him through the door, so they climb up on the roof by an outdoor stair. You know the story, you can see it. There's wonderful paintings. You can Google this, you can try it at home. But anyway, they get to the, the top of the roof and they dig through the the uh, sod roof, I would imagine. Some say they move the roof tiles, but in any case, they get a hole through the roof, and the four of them lower your man down to the feet of Jesus for his healing. Jesus is, now, the reason this is important to Heaney, he had suffered just a couple of years ago, 2006, he had suffered a stroke. He was up in Donegal, and he woke up in a 
in a bed and breakfast next to his wife with his left side paralyzed. And the other people who had been to the house, so it was dear friends of his, Des, Kenny, and his wife, Mary, and uh, Peter Sir, and uh, his wife, uh, I can tell you the names because he dedicates this book to, to him, this book, he, yeah, Peter and Jean, um, this book he calls Human Chain, which is kind of like that human ladder, your man, Jackie Wesley, uh, that saved his life. And on the day, he was on the third floor of this guest house in Donegal, and so they brought a gurney up the steps of this old house. And Heaney, who's about, he's a big farm boy, he's six foot something, and uh, of, of similar bulk to myself. And anyway, they strapped him onto the, uh, the stretcher and then tilted him up and bounced him all the way down three flights of stairs, holding on to keep him from being rattled entirely, and then loaded him into the ambulance, which sped him to Letterkenny Hospital and his eventual his eventual cure. Like Lazarus, he later died, but uh, for, on the day it was reckoned to him a miracle that he suffered the stroke and was restored. And on the day I heard him in what is, I think, called Glen Memorial Chapel, an old Methodist church on the campus of Emory University, when I heard him read this poem, I was very moved because I've been corresponding, I've been corresponding with him for years, we <coughs> had become friends of a sort. Um, I had walked with him some months before, up the hill to the grave of a dear friend of both of ours, chatting away like we were going to live forever, and here, eight months later, on the 30th of August, he turned up dead. But before that, here he was reading in Atlanta, in the church, and he read this poem about the paralytic, something he understood, being healed by Jesus. And Heaney's poem asks us to look elsewhere in the room. He says, don't look at the, the guy on the cot. Don't look at the Savior. Don't look at the evident miracles. You remember the rest of the story. Jesus says as soon as he lands on the ground, he says, uh, son, he was impressed by his faith. He says, your sins are forgiven. Over in the corner are some begrudgers. There are always begrudgers. We know this to be true. And they were begrudging to themselves about how we've got him now. Only God can forgive sin. Isn't that the deal in the first, at that time of the world? And uh, Jesus, because he's Jesus, said, why are you thinking that way in your heart of hearts? What would be easier to say, or what would be more difficult, he says, to say, your sins are forgiven you? or stand and walk. In other words, which miracle is tougher? The one you can't see or the one you can? The inside job or the outside job? Of course, it's a trick question. Almost every time Jesus goes asking questions of mere mortals, it's a trick question because Forgiveness sometimes seems so impossible. We've all been done unto and damaged and heartworn and heart sore. How can we let go of such hurts? And we are all paralyzed by them. How can we get up and move and go home? How will we ever find our way home? Be deviled by and burdened by all these harms that have been done all the things that should never have happened but still do in a world supposedly overseen by a loving God, an all-powerful God. All we can say like is what Job said, God is good. And when he really wanted to know and he said, what, 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 what's missing in my loyalty to you, God? All God could say is, where were you when I made the world? These things are outside your pay grade. Heaney asked us to consider the possibility that we partake in the miraculous ourselves, that we are one another's miracles. Miracle. Not the one who takes up his bed and walks, but the ones who have known him all along and carry him in. 
their shoulders numb, the ache and stoop deep locked in their backs, the stretcher handles slippery with sweat and no let up until he's strapped on tight, made tiltable and raised to the tiled roof, then lowered for healing. Be mindful of them who stand and wait for the burn of the paid out ropes to cool, their slight light headedness and incredulity to pass, the ones who had known him all along. We are to one another the ones who have known each other all along. I sometimes think we are called to be each other's saviors. And who we save each other from is mostly from ourselves. We are imbued with the miraculous. And if we show up, pitch in, and do our part, we can be the miracles that are required in this world. So the fist that we shake in God's face, bring it down and put it to the good, large muscle work of lifting and carrying and lowering and raising. It will stand us all in much better stead. God bless and keep you.